can you uh, lower okay. the lights so we can see a little better? Ah, uh, lower the light? Like this? Yeah. Is that any better? No. A little. A little? Are all the lights in this classroom on? Yeah. No, that's, that's much worse. What about that? No, that's worse. <coughs> that's as good as it gets today, I suppose. <coughs> Maybe like this? No, it doesn't help. Okay, <coughs> so any questions about the GCD exercise? Today's what, the 28th? Yes. <coughs> Any question about the GCD exercise? This one is okay. So just to be just to remind us, okay, how did how did that go? <coughs> so the GCD, the extended GCD. of inputs A and B, supposing that A and B are legitimate inputs, which is to say A and B are both integers, both non-negative and at least one of them positive. So in such a case, there's two base cases. <clears throat> okay, one of the base cases is that the GCD is A when what? When is the GCD A? When, when, B is zero. Zero. when the other one is zero. <clears throat> and now, there's two other outputs we need to produce here. So, <clears throat> the outputs are <coughs> D, X, and Y is the GCD, and what what each of these are is that D should be the GCD of A and B, and what are X and Y? Not the new AB. What are X and Y in the extended GCD? <coughs> yes. So these. give you that D is AX plus BY. So X and Y have their own special names. They're named after a person. Uh, that's definitely related, but these particular numbers are called the Bezu coefficients. And I, I make no warranty as to whether or not I'm pronouncing that name correctly. <laughs> okay, so then supposing that B is zero, Supposing that B is zero, my question to you is, is what, are, what are the correct Bezu coefficients? Zero. A. One and zero. One and zero. Oh. Right? Which is to say, X needs to be one and Y needs to be zero so that, so that this equation will be true, right? A is equal to A times one plus B times zero. Okay. <clears throat> What's the other base case? Okay, good. So that, that's the condition in which the case is invoked when A is zero. So what is the output in such a case? What is the greatest common divisor? B. B. And then what are the Bezu coefficients? Zero and one. Zero and one. Again, <coughs> this is so that this equation is satisfied. So <coughs> in computation, in computation, you're, you're in a sense, computing downward. Okay. What this is saying is that when you get to a base case, okay, you definitely have the GCD correct because we already discussed how to compute GCD and we're doing exactly that. And in each of these base cases, you definitely have the Bezu coefficients correct because you can verify these 1, 0, and 0, 1 are exactly correct according to that equation right here and now. Okay, then the question is, is that, okay, that, those are the base cases. How do you handle the recursive case? So the general idea is, <coughs> the general idea is, is that you recurse to a smaller case, 
it recurs to a smaller case, and then it returns to you the GCD and Bezu coefficients corresponding to the smaller case. And what you must do is you keep that same GCD because the GCD is the same, but you have to turn the Bezu coefficients for the smaller case into the Bezu <coughs> coefficients for your case. Okay, so then suppose we're in the recursive case. So otherwise, this requires a little bit of computation. Otherwise, all these things are happening below. <coughs> so otherwise, this means that we need to compute the quotient and remainder of A divided by B. Okay, which is to say, <coughs> suppose that A is equal to QB plus R, where Q and R are from the division algorithm. So in particular, what must be true about R? That, that's not that's not necessary. If 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 uh, B is a divisor of A, then R can be zero. In fact, must be zero. R is right. So I'll I'll write it like this: zero less or equal to R less than B. Which is to say that R is now smaller. R is now smaller than uh, B. <coughs> So we'll take this and let's say, let's say that we have recursed and determined that d x1 y1 is EGCD of b and r. So notice that this is a smaller problem than the one that is, that is originally posed because r is smaller than b now. So what this is saying, what this is saying, what equation must be true according to this statement? So something that looks like this, but to be specific, what? D equals bx1 plus r y1. Yes, d is bx1 plus r y1. Okay, which is to say that the greatest common divisor of B and R is D, and the Bezu coefficients for which, which produce that are X1 and Y1. So now what we want to do is we want to, we want to take these Bezu coefficients and, and turn them into Bezu coefficients for A and B. Well, the real trick, the only trick, is that we have two equations here. We have the red equation, which is the result of the division algorithm, and we have the green equation, which is the result of having evaluated the recursive case. So what we want to do is combine the red and green equations into an equation which corresponds to the Bezu coefficients for A and B. So how do we do it? Solve for R in the red equation. Right. Take the red equation, solve for R, substitute it into the green equation. Okay, so this one. into this one. <coughs> okay, then doing that, you obtain D is BX1 plus, now taking this and solving for R, that'd be A minus QB. And then Y1. <coughs> okay, now we just collect uh, all the terms on A and B. So observe that here we're going to have, that's the only place where we get A, so that'd be AY1. And then plus, now we have two places where we'll get B stuff from that term and from this distribution. So supposing that we factor out the B, what goes in here? X1 minus QY1. Yes, X1 minus q y1. Do you observe now that this number and this number 
are the Bezu coefficients that we were that we were searching for. These are exactly the ones. So therefore, concerning considering this <laughs> this otherwise case here, <laughs> got a long long tail there. What's the answer then? Yes, d y one and then x one minus q y one. Lovely. So the the general idea is just the following: that you have to correctly discern and determine a base case. Okay, you will definitely get to the base case. If, if you believe that the GCD always gets to the base case. Right? You'll have to take a number theory class or something like that to be 100% to be certain that the Euclidean algorithm must terminate. Uh, but I promise you that it does in all cases. So, I, so if you accept my promise that you will eventually reach a base case, then this recursive case is how you build up the Bezu coefficients from the bottom. Coming, uh, coming back out. Okay, so let's have an example of doing this real quick. <coughs> so for example, I could say, please compute the extended GCD of <coughs> uh, 60 and 32. Okay, now we've already considered this example a couple times, and the numbers, because <coughs> height, the numbers are smaller, small enough that you should just be able to more or less tell me the answer right away. The GCD is four, and then can you think of two coefficients for 60 and 32 so that you could get four from them? Mm -hmm. Two of these, negative one of those, will give you four. Okay, so then we know. We know that the answer to this is 4, negative 1, 2. So we know that. But here's, here's the rub and the catch, is that in this class, the purpose is that you want to become comfortable with getting a machine to do this for you. How do you describe this to a machine and understand what the machine is doing? So let's carefully compute exactly what's going on. So let's consider this computation right here. Okay. So how many how many variables are really necessary to compute? Well, we've got a we've got two inputs A and B, right? Then um, we've got three outputs D X and Y. So that's at least five variables because we've got two in and three out. What else do we have? R. R and Q, both of which we'll need. We need Q right there. So that's uh, seven slots. And then what else? There's, a, there's two more <laughs> that are intermediate. X1 and Y1. So there's nine slots. Okay, there's the two inputs, the three outputs, Q and R are, are intermediate, and X1 and Y1 are intermediate. So those are all things that we have to keep track of. So let's, let's watch how the, how the computation proceeds. OK. This is where I wish I had brought graph paper. OK, so we have A. B, I already lost track, uh, D, X, Y, Q, R, X1, Y1. Okay. So we've got a table that looks more or less like this. <clears throat> so supposing that uh, we make this call, there's two values that we know. 
What two values do we know? Yeah? Because just, you can think of it just brain magic, right? So then, which is to say, do you observe what's 2 times 32? 64. And then negative 1 times 60 is negative 60. And do you observe and agree that 64 minus 60 is 4? That's all that I mean. So there's just brain magic. The question is, how, how do you get the algorithm to churn out those numbers? Okay, so then which variables do we know? We know A and B, and their values are 60 and 32. And then just looking at the definition, the first thing we need to ask ourselves, selves, is is this a base case? It is not a base case. Therefore, we must initiate the recursive case. Which is to say, we need the, the first thing we need to do is compute Q and R. Okay. So 60, 32. And now, we've, we've done quotient and remainder carefully in, in previous classes, so now I'm just going to assume we can do this immediately. What are the quotient and remainder of 60 by 32? Uh, 1 in 28. 1 in 28. 1 and 28. That's too small. <clears throat> okay. Then, what is it that we do with this information, 1 and 28? As soon as we determine that the quotient and remainder are 1 and 28, then what? Well, now, now we must recurse, right? Because we, could, we can't get any farther until we know the Bayesian coefficients that the person below us wants to give us. So let's recurse, which is to say, now we're going to recurse to what? So A, B, X, Y, Q, R, <laughs> X1, Y1. So now we're recursing to this case. What are A and B here for this one? 32 and 28. 32 and 28. Which is to say that the values that are being put in here are B from the previous table and R from the previous table. Okay. Then now that we're in here, the first thing that we ask ourselves is what? Even before that, we ask, is this a base case? So is it a base case? No. It isn't. So that means that we must now start building up the recursive call. To build up the recursive call, we need to compute Q and R. Well, what is the quotient and remainder of 32 by 28? 1 and 4. So is there any question why this is the case? OK. So now that we have determined the quotient and remainder for this table, now it's time to do what? Recurse. To recurse. Okay. You purposely leave off uh, D from the second table? No. <laughs> I did not. Darn. <coughs> Thanks. <laughs> it could have got. It could have been worse. 
more to erase. Okay, let's try that again. So D, X, Y, Q, R, X1, Y1. So Q was 1 and R was 4. Okay, so A, B, D, X, Y, Q, R, X1, Y1. Okay. It, it's, it's examples like this, I hope, that really bring home two, two things. In the first place, I want you to really understand what the machine is doing. That's, a, that's very important. I also want you to appreciate just how fast the machine does this. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> so, what are, the, what are the values that we know? Uh, A and B. A and B. And what are they? 28 and 4. 28 and 4. Which is to say, that's the B and the R from the previous table. Okay, so what's the first thing we ask ourselves? Is this a base case? Is this a base case? Well, is it? No. It is not. <coughs> so then that means we need to start building up the recursive case. Which is to say, we need to compute the quotient and remainder. Well, what is the quotient and remainder of 28 by 4? 7 and 0. 7 and 0. Okay. Then, now we're going to recurse. A, B, D, X, Y, Q, R, X1, Y1. Okay. So what are the values of A and B that we know? 4 and 0. Four and, zero. and what is the first thing we always ask ourselves? Base case. <laughs> is it a base case? Well? Yes. <laughs> it is, right? So then, that means that there, it is not necessary to set up the recursive case. Rather, it's time to exit. So A and B are still 4 and 0, but now D, X, and Y all have definite values. What are their values? D equals 4. 4. 1. And 0. Okay. So now there's nothing, there's no more recursion to, to, <coughs> to do. So now what's happening is that <coughs> now this D, where does this D go now? It goes up, right? which is to say this D becomes a D right here. Where does this X go? X1. And where does this Y go? To Y1. <coughs> so if you like, now we can draw these going down, is that this B became this A, and this R became this B. <coughs> This B became this A. This R became this B. This B became that A. This R became that B. <coughs> OK. So now we can make a new row in the table above. That's still 28 and 4. This is still 7 and 0, but now we know that this is 4, and that this is 1, and that this is 0. Okay.
So that's the return of the recursive call. So now what? What we know is that this d and this x1, y1 constitutes the Bayesian coefficients for the previous problem, for the recursive problem that just, got, that just got back to us. Now we need to turn these values into those values. Okay, but we, we came up with the formula on the previous page. The formula is right there. Which is to say that <coughs> if you like to have a formula, x is y1 and y is x1 minus qy1. So now it's just a matter of taking this formula back up out of the computation. So what are the new values of x and y according to this? So, y, so x will now be 0. And then <coughs> what is y going to be? One. x1, yeah, minus 7 times 0. So it'll just be 1. <coughs> so now, let's check and make sure that that's right. A and B are 28 and 4. Is it true that D is equal to AX plus BY? <laughs> is it true that D, 4, is 28 times 0 plus 4 times 1? It is true. It is true. It is true, right? So that means that we, we've now satisfied the Bezu coefficients for this table. So now what happens? Values go up, right? This D goes here. This X to X1. This Y to Y1. <coughs> 32, 28, 4, this is still 1, this is still 4, and this is now 0 and 1. So now this d and this xy are the Bayesian coefficients from the previous case. And we have the formula that turns these, x1, y1, into these, x and y. Okay. So what are x and y on this table? Uh, one. 1, yes, and Negative. 0 minus 1 times 1, so negative 1. Now, is it true, now that we've performed that computation, that in this table, D is A times X plus B times Y? Yes. It is true, right? Because, it's, because 4 is 32 times 1 plus 28 times negative 1. It's true now. Okay, now what? goes up. This D to that D, this X to, oops, to X1, and this Y to Y1. Okay, so then 62, 32, 4, this is still 1, this is still 28, and now these are 1 and negative 1. OK. So then now we just apply this formula. What is the value for x? Negative 1. And what is the value for y? Well, it should be 1 minus 1 times negative 1. So 1 minus negative 1 is 2. Do these A, B, D, X, and Y satisfy the Bezu equation? Yes. They do, right? Even that's what we said before we even started doing this, right? Do you observe 4, negative 1, and 2? 4, negative 1, and 2. So this is the way the computation goes, except the machine is able to do it marginally more rapid than we can on paper, right? <laughs> So the other one, 
which I'll not describe in such detail because it because I did describe it in the, the actual homework. It's, it's exactly like this, but what I want you to observe is that the way this one works is you're computing going down, those are the red arrows, and you're recording things in each table, right? So for example, before on this table, before we recurse downward, we computed a value of Q and R. We used the R to go down, but we didn't use the Q until we came back up. So some of the computation is occurring in the red direction, in the downward direction, and some of the computation is occurring in the green direction, the upward direction. Okay, the tail recursive, um, the tail recursive extended GCD that I described in the exercise is a, is a, it modifies the computation so that everything occurs going down. So instead of main, instead of coming to the end and then building up the the Bezu equation going back up, you start with an equation that is not a Bezu equation. It's not. But by the time you hit the bottom, it is. Okay. Interesting. So any questions about this? Okay. <clears throat> so now let's do a different exercise. Completely different. So we're going to start out by just playing a game. Okay. So um, <clears throat> I need a I need a volunteer, and what I need this volunteer to do is I need them to choose a positive integer that's you know of a reasonable size, right? Not something like a Google. Okay something of a reasonable size and what I'm going to do is I'm going to guess but the only thing that you can tell me the only thing you're allowed to tell me is if I've guessed too low or I, or I have it right or if I've guessed too high that's it okay so can I have a volunteer okay so so you have a you have a number in mind okay and, it, and it's a positive integer it is a positive integer okay So I'm going to start out by, here's me, just, this is just pencil and paper. So I'm going to start by asking, how do you respond to one? Uh, two low. OK. Uh, so then how do you respond to two? Uh, also two low. Four? Two low. Eight? Two low. Seven? Two low. Sixteen? Uh, once again, two low. Thirty-two? Yep. 64. Yep. Okay, so I'm I'm not going to do this forever, right? Uh, you're right okay, 128. Uh, no. 256. Nope. 512. Nope. 1024. Uh, nope. 2048. Nope. 4096. Nope. 8192. Nope. <laughs> I'm starting to lose my ability to double here. 6 Okay, what's the next one? If you want, I can just change it so we'll say that that was too high. Okay, good. I, li I like it. This is fine. Okay, so now, so I'd like to point out that what the responses I received were, okay, this was a negative one, this was a negative one, this was a negative one, which is to say too low. And then a one which is to say, ah, too high now. Now, do, do you observe that this is really, so far, just like the least upper bound and greatest lower bound question? Yeah. Okay, now, from, from these responses, I have established, I have established that uh, between these two numbers. So in fact, in fact, I can do just slightly better than this, because I know that he said that this one was too low, and I know that he said that this one was too high, and the rules of the game require that the true answer is, a, is an integer. So at this point, at this point, I can now move to a different phase, and I can say that I know that the answer is between what two numbers? 4,000 and 8,000. Between 
4097 inclusive. That's the smallest integer it could possibly be. And 819 what? Not 3. 1, right? Because that one's too big. So it's in this interval of integers. It couldn't possibly be anything else besides these. So now what I want to do, now that I've established a lower and upper bound of integers, okay, I want to, as quickly as possible, come to the integer that must be in his head. OK. But I can still only ask the same questions. So let's sort of look at this. So there's a lattice of points. We have 4097 is the smallest candidate, and 8191 is the largest candidate. Who has a good idea about what I should guess? Yeah? If you guess the average of those two numbers, then you'll immediately rule out half of that interval. Or if I'm extremely lucky, you'll get it right. I'll get, I get the right answer, right? If, if supposing I'm extremely lucky. Okay, so let's compute the average of those two numbers. Okay, so that is uh, to say 4097 plus 8191 over 2. So now this is just, this is just slightly wrong, just slightly. It's not, it's not wrong, but it'll, it's, it's not wrong here, but it's generally wrong. And I'll, I'll, not quite, not quite. Something, something less um, complicated than that. No, sorry. 4097 minus, no, plus. Couldn't we just recycle 2048? Because that's like about. Um, I like that. I, I do like that. However, that will only work once. Which is to say, you would add this much to that one, right? I, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm with you. I agree. But, uh, but if we just do it with the computation, then we need remember nothing. Okay, so now the average of these two is 6144. Okay, so how do you respond to 6144? Uh, too low. Too low. So that, that was my guess, 6144. And I didn't guess right, but I do know something now. What? Eight one nine one. This one, this one doesn't move, right? Okay. This one doesn't move because it could, in principle, be eight one nine one. Okay. So that means that my new answer, my my new interval is 6145, right? Because it couldn't be 6144. All the way up to 8191. OK. So that is to say that this one became that one. And this one became this one. Okay. Now what should I guess? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if it worked good once, then I'll, I'll, I'll work good again, right? So 6145 plus 8191 and then over to 7168. <clears throat> uh, so my guess is 7168. So how do you respond? It's too high. Ah, interesting. <laughs> so that means that that means that now this one stayed still. <clears throat> and this is the one that moved to the side. So what is the correct number here? Seven, one, six, seven. 
Right, 7167. No, wait a minute. How come, wait a second. 6144 to 6145 and 7168 to 7167? 7168 is too high. Right. Okay. So so it couldn't possibly be 7168. So the so the next possible next possibility is 7167. Okay. <clears throat> so now these are approximately a thousand apart. On the order of a thousand apart. Now, can anyone venture a guess as to how many how many more guesses do I need to make? Yes? It's proportional to uh, the logarithm base 2 of the guess. Right. Because here's the thing, is that if I continue with this strategy, at every, at every instant, supposing that I never guess correctly, I've, I'm eliminating half of all possibilities. And the question is, is if you had a, if you had a bag of a thousand things, how many times could you, could you have the number of things? It's is this how we officially sort through a sorted list? Yes. So th this is called binary search, yes? So it seems like you're using the equal or operator. For, um, that's why you're changing the numbers by one at a time. If you just did the uh, in between but not equal, then wouldn't you not have to change the numbers? Ah, but you want to change the numbers. So what, what I'm saying is that if, if you remember the statement of the game, and we haven't written it down precisely, but the way he's allowed to respond is, you are too small, you have, you have guessed right, or you have guessed too high. Those are the three responses, which is to say it's the trichotomy of, of order. You're either to the left, yeah. on top, or to the right. But like that, that first one, because um, 4096 was too low? Yeah. You could just say 4096. I'm not sure I follow you. So what this, what this one is saying is that 4096 is too small. So it never makes sense again to ask about 4096. Because we've already established it couldn't be that. Yeah. So the next possibility is 4097. But if it's greater than and not equal to, then it already excludes that. I think you're agreeing here. Uh, yeah, it sounds like we're saying the same thing. But I mean, uh, once you calculate it on the right, you wouldn't have to keep track of which one goes up and which one goes down. I think in the grand scheme of things, it's very small to the search space, right? Very tiny reduction of the search space. Ah, it, it, it does, actually. It does. And the, the reason is, be oh, now I see. So we, I think you're saying is, what if we just dispense with the adding one and subtracting one? Okay, that, that algorithm will not converge. It won't converge because, because, supposing, supposing that um, we had two choices, one and two. Okay, what, what would you guess? Well, you can't guess one and a half, because one and a half isn't an integer. So suppose that you guess one, and I say that one is too small. Then your new left endpoint, according to your scheme, would be one. <laughs> and your new right endpoint would be two, which is the same place that you were before. Okay. Whereas, if you were adding one, your left endpoint would be two, and your right endpoint would be two, and your next guess would be two. Yeah, so you gotta be think very carefully about the base cases. Okay, so let's do a couple more just to make sure it's clear. So what what would we guess? Six one, the, the the average of those, right? Six one four five plus seven one six seven over two. Six six five six. So I'm gonna guess six six five six. Uh, six one four five. And what was the other one? Oh, it's right here. Seven one seven one six seven. Six. So, <clears throat> okay, what just happened here? No, oh, I'm supposed to be drawing right there. Okay, now I see, sorry. Got, 
Y'all got me talking and you got me confused. Six, six, five, six. Okay, so how do you respond to six, six, five, six? Do, do you have a response to six, six, five, six? Uh, it is too low. Too low. Yes. Okay. So that, okay, so that means that this one less one is the new upper bound, right? And that is the new, is the same lower bound. So this one goes here. Oh, it's too low. Okay, so this one, this one, and and one is the new lower bound. As the new, what am I saying? Too low. Yeah. Okay. So this one goes here. And this one here. So this would be seven one six seven. And then what is this one? Six six five seven. Now, unfortunately, because of the way things are, we're never going to come to a place that um, where I have to show the last bit of the algorithm that's important to keep track of, <laughs> and that is that because of the way things are currently, all these numbers are both both of these endpoints are odd. Okay, so now, d can you can you imagine that we could finish this in about nine more steps? Okay just by bisecting. So now I have a, a different abstract question for you. Suppose that we were in the recursive case and we knew and our present lower bound and present upper bound were 21 and 100. Then what should we guess? 16? 16. Okay, how did you arrive at this? <laughs> one, one of those, <laughs> right? So notab notably, what I'd like for you to observe is that this, the average of these two endpoints is not an in integer, okay? Which is to say that this midpoint here is, uh, 100, is 21 plus 100 over 2. That'd be 121. That'd be 65 and a half. Uh, what am I saying? 60 and a half. That's not an integer, so you should never guess that. Okay, because it couldn't possibly be that anyway. So, so we need a w <laughs> we need a way to make sure that we that we always guess an integer. Okay, so so you said round. Okay, that's good, but that's not the mathematician's word. Right, the floor function, or the nearest, the the least integer function. So. The math notation is this, in case you're not familiar with it. It is a square bracket that only has feet. So that rounds down to the nearest integer. How do you suppose you denote the, the one where you round up? Where it's only feet. on the top. Yeah, square brackets with feet on the top. And if this is pronounced floor, ceiling. then the other one is pronounced ceiling. And if you want to do this in MATLAB, in MATLAB, the floor of 60.5, MATLAB will respond with 60. Uh, for this type of problem, mm -hmm. would it matter whether we used floor or ceiling? Uh, no, it does not. Okay. The only thing that, that really matters is that you keep track of the endpoints. Okay. And and just keep note that if you if you don't in the first place if you don't add um, if you don't add one or subtract one to the, to the endpoints what happens is that if you're consistently choosing choosing floor if it so happens that um, <laughs> that you've guessed if, if, you can if you consistently choose floor, and it so happens that the correct answer is your right endpoint, then you'll never guess correctly. Your algorithm will never, never terminate. And if you consistently choose ceiling, and it so happens that the left endpoint is the correct answer, your, argument will, your, your program will never terminate. So, so that's why it's important to do something. You have to either 
consistently add one and subtract one, or more or less randomly select between floor and ceiling. <laughs> because, so then that your algorithm will probabilistically terminate. Okay, good, any question about this? So, now here's the interesting, yes? In MATLAB, is it just ceiling parentheses and number? Uh, it is, it is seal, ceiling without the ing. Okay. <laughs> Because apparently ing would be extremely costly. I have no idea. <laughs> but it's called seal. Okay. Without the, so sealing without the ing. Um, now, what's interesting about this is that, you know, what if, let, let's consider just how fast could we get there. Suppose that my number was 4 billion. There's two phases to this algorithm. One of the phases is when I first say, I'm thinking of a positive integer. You have no idea what, where it might reside. So the first thing you need to establish is where it resides. So which is to say, between two, what powers of two. So suppose that I say to you, I'm thinking of a number, a positive integer, and in, in my head, I have hidden four billion. How many of these will you have to guess? 32 around 32. That's it. Suppose, suppose that, okay, here's, here's an interesting thing. Um, the number of atoms in the observable universe, not even the number of atoms, but the number of protons. How many is that? A lot. A lot. 10 to the 40? 80. 10 to 80. <laughs> yeah. 10 to 80, which is called Eddington's number. That's all the protons that exist. Approximately, it's too many. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, you know, you might wonder, well, supposing that my, my hidden number is Eddington's number, 10 to the 80, how many times will you have to double? You might, <laughs> yeah, not that many. <laughs> On the order of definitely less than 1,000, much less than 1,000. Okay. So now suppose that we've established, say, that, that you've somehow established that the correct answer is between um, 8 billion and 12 billion. There's a lot of numbers between <coughs> 8 billion and 12 billion. How many, right? There's, there's, there's about 4 billion of them. <laughs> integers. Just about. Okay. How many guesses will it take for you to determine the correct answer? 32. 32. Why 32? That's the logarithm base to uh, uh, round it up. Right. Okay. So what I'm trying to get it across to you is that is that given any any reasonable number that a human, even a mathematician, would think of, unless they were like a very specialized mathematician, you ask number. yeah, you ask them to think of some number, and you you get them to agree that they'll say you're too low, you have it, or you're too high. Within less than a hundred queries of them, you can figure out the answer. Unless they choose some just ridiculous number. Like Ackerman's number or something. A fair notation. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Good. So now, let's think of something slightly more concrete. Um, <clears throat> I have a question for you. How about the number 93? Um, can you tell me? Can you, to, to the nearest integer, can you tell me what its square root is? 93. 10. Uh, it's between 9 and 10, right? Got to be between 9 and 10. Why is it between 9 and 10? 81 and 100. 81 and 100, right? And then... Now that, now that you know what game I'm playing, you know, I could ask you anything, right? So how about, what are the nearest integers to, say, the square root of 140? 11 and 12. 11 and 12, right? It's between 11 and 12. So now, now, suppose that I want you to compute the, the floor of the square root of a given integer, okay? And you are to do so using um, only multiplications 
only add, subtract, and multiplications or divisions by two. And you're, you obviously cannot use the SQRT function, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Or the floor one. Right. So, so can someone describe an efficient algorithm to, to do it? Yes? I'll do that one. There's an iterative method to find. This is actually how I guess square roots are. Ah, but that uses division. We're, not doing, we're doing that next week. Okay. But I agree. I agree that that's in principle a good way. But I've, yes? So I'll use the Taylor series extension of uh, these are all too complicated. We don't want to use fancy things like like division. I mean, I agree in principle all those things would work. Yes? We could build a table of square numbers and find which two are larger and smaller than it immediately, and then from there... I like that. So that's like, that's like what humans do, right? Yeah. So when I said 140, y'all said... Uh, and, <laughs> then, and then, yeah, that's what humans did. Yes? Uh, we could just keep adding odd numbers. That's true, isn't it? Right? <laughs> I like that. I hadn't even thought about that one. Okay, good. Now, okay, so now I'm gonna now I'm gonna be. This has been pretty open-ended. Now I'm gonna try and direct you more directly to the answer I'm looking for. In light of the guess the number game that we just described, can you think of a means to efficiently determine the floor of the square root of any integer? In, in an analogous fashion to the guess the number game. Would it be the table that I described? Kind of. I guess you could do it on the fly. You don't have to create the table, right? You could just compute the squares at every point. Right. We yeah. could just do like the same algorithm as the other one, except guess the square of the number. Yeah. Right. So then, now, suppose that suppose that the number that I'm thinking of is like. Um, a million. By the way, what's the square root of a million? A thousand. So if you sequentially went through there, you'd have to check one and then two and then three and then four all the way. You'd have to make a thousand guesses. So sequential guessing definitely will get the job done. But can you think of a better way than sequential guessing? Can we take logarithms? No logs. <laughs> yes? I mean, I guess we could use that sort of power of two thing, but what's knowing is like only half of them are actual squares, the other half aren't really squares. Right. So now, now here's, here's a method. Okay? So we can, we can start doubling. Okay, and find which powers of two is between. Then we can start doing exactly the, the same kind of strategy before. So let's suppose now. Suppose that the hidden number the hidden number is, say, n is 1 million and 3. Okay. So, this, so the square root of a million and 3 is a little bit more than 1,000, but the floor of that, the floor of the square root of a million and 3 is exactly 1,000. Okay, so that's the, that's the number that we're looking for, but now we have to understand that you don't have access to this number. All you have access to is, um, <clears throat> or you don't, you don't have access to the true square root. All you have access to is this number. Okay. So, <clears throat> let's wonder here. So, how about um, one? Well, that's, um, that's too small. So then now let's double that. So if, if 1 is our guess, let's now square 1. Well, what's 1 squared? 1. 1, okay, which is 1. Okay, so let's double that. And what's 2 squared? 4. 4. That's still smaller than this. So the answer's got to be bigger than 2. Let's double this, 4. What's 4 squared? 16. Okay, that's smaller than this. So the answer's got to be more than 4. 8. 64. 64. <clears throat> Still smaller. 16. 256. <laughs> Still smaller. 32. Now here's where I'm not sure. <laughs> 3, 3, 2 squared. 1, 0, 2, 4. I guess I should have known that one. 1, 0, 2, 4. Uh, 6, 4. Four zero nine six. 
one two eight. One six three eight four. So when am I going to stop doing this? Once you double over a thousand. Yeah, when this number right here gets over. Well, no, you can't use a thousand because that's using secret knowledge, right? <laughs> well, over. It's when this one is more than that one. Yeah. Right. So then two five six. So now this is. Six five five three six five one two two six two one four four. So this number is still smaller than that number, and then finally one zero two four <coughs> and one zero two four squared is this number. So 1, 0, 4, 8, 5, 7, 6. So now, notice that what we're saying is that we took this number, we said, well, could the square root be 16? So the way we were, we were establishing yes or no was we're saying, well, let's square 16. Oh, that's not big enough. Okay. Well, is the, could the square be 32? The square root be 32. Well, let's square it. 1, 0, 2, 4. Oh, that's not big enough. So then now we, we got to 1, 0, 2, 4. We asked, could 1, 0, 2, 4 be the square? Okay, so we squared it. And we observed, ah, this number, this number is bigger. So that means that the true square, the floor of the, sorry, the true square root, the floor of the square root that we're looking for is between 512 and 1024. This one is too small, and that one is too big. But now we know an interval in which it resides. So now what? Yes? So apparently there exists a fast algorithm for determining those bounds that if you have it in scientific notation form, mm -hmm. you can, um, in essentially, I guess, four operations determine its order of magnitude. I, I agree entirely. I, I do. Uh, but. That's, a, that's assuming that you already have it just so, right? So then, so then the work that essentially we're doing is making it just so. So what, what, what we've established essentially is that the exponent in, in binary instead of, instead of decimal is between uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. The exponent is, uh, the exponent is at most 9, and we need to figure out the mantissa, or whatever the other thing is called. OK. So now what can we do? Fill their interval again, and start finding the yeah. Right. We know that 512 is too small. We know that 1024 is too big. So the smallest possible square root of all the current candidates is 513. And the largest possible square root of all possible candidates is 1024. Uh, sorry, 1023. So now, these are all the candidates. The, the, the floor of the square root is either 513, 514, 515, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way up to 1023. So now, how do we start guessing? <laughs> By bisecting, right? Exactly what we did two pages ago, or whatever that was. OK, now, that being said, this is, this is neat, okay, sort of in, a, in an algorithmic sense. But there are far superior ways to go about doing this. So notably, notably to do this, this required 1, 2, 3, 4, 10 steps. It's going to require. Uh, another eight steps to get to the end. So we we're going to determine the answer in around 20 steps, on the order of 20 steps for this particular, um, <coughs> for that particular number. So now, what if I told you that using a little bit of calculus instead of this sort of simple-minded doubling and bisection, 
that we could actually come to the correct answer in approximately five steps. For this one, and for that matter, for everyone, as more or less, up to, a, up to a certain precision. So next week, what we're going to do is we're going to calculate square roots and other things, and we're going to do so using methods that are slightly more clever uh, that in the end come from calculus. So now, <clears throat> in order to foreshadow that, I want to write down the following. So here is the method, more or less, that calculators use to compute square roots. And now these are square roots of, uh, not, not integer square roots, not floors of square roots, but actual square roots. So you make some initial guess, and then you can determine the next guess with the following formula. So supposing we wanted to compute the square root of, say, uh, 10. <clears throat> then that would be 10 over xn, and then divide by 2. So now, <clears throat> suppose that xn is 1. Then this one is too small, right? 1 is too small because the true square root of 10 is actually about 3.16. Then 10 over 1, that would be 10, so that one would be too big. So do you observe that this one would be too small, and that one would be too big, and then we're going to average them, and then the hope is that, you might think, the hope is that we'd get to something closer. So let's compute this. Let's compute the square root of 10 using this method real quick just so you can see just how fast it is. So there's two values in the table, essentially. <clears throat> we'll call them x and b. So the first value of x, which is to say our first guess, is 1. And if this is really, if we're computing the square root of 10. So now what we want to put here is 1 plus 10 over 1 and then over 2. 1, so what I'm using to compute the next thing is this formula. <clears throat> 1 plus <clears throat> 10 over 1 <clears throat> and then over 2. So 5.5 is my next guess. So what What's going to be the next computation? <clears throat> right. Now, 5.5 is too big because the true square root is about 3.16. But then 10 over 5.5, that's less than 2. So this one is too small. So again, we have one that's too big, one that's too small, and then we're going to average them. So now, I'll proceed through the rest of this quickly. So ands plus over ands. So the next one is 3.65, 3.659. The one after that is 3.19, 6. The one after that is 3.16, 2. The one after that has converged to at least three decimal places. Incredible. And now the incredible thing is, is that there's nothing magical, magical about 10, is we would have gotten more or less the same rapidity, even if we had chosen a much larger number. So we'll talk about that next time, and I'll see you on Thursday.